Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Wakeling. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians uh, of the land of Canberra in Australia, which is where I am uh, based at the moment. Um, so welcome and, and thank you to uh, for joining us on this first session of day three of Force 2023. Um, uh, we have two presentations um, today. First, we're going to hear from Matt Byes of Datasite, um, who will be uh, presenting on looking ahead a global corpus uh, for all data citations um, and later on we'll be hearing from Annalisa Gastaldello um, on her presentation increased reliability of science with open dynamic and live methods in scholarly communication. Um, so first we'll hear from Matt. Matt leads the team at Datasite who provide the means to create, find, cite, connect and use research globally. Datasite, as I'm sure many of you know, is a global community that shares a common interest to ensure that research outputs and resources are openly available and connected so that their reuse can advance knowledge across and between disciplines. Prior to joining Datasite, Matt was the Director of Engagement at ORCID, where he played a key role in growing that community into an international scale research effort. So without further ado, Matt, I'll pass over to you. Great, thanks very much for the introduction, Simon. And I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, if I can just check that everyone can see that. Um, yep, looks good to me. Okay, great. So um, yeah, thanks um, for the introduction. It's good to be here and um, always great um, talking to the community about some of the uh, exciting efforts that we have underway at Datasite and across the community. And specifically today, I'm going to focus a bit about a large effort that we have launched at Datasite in building a global corpus for all data citations. Um, I'll call out uh, right from the start that this is an initiative that has been funded by the Wellcome Trust that really took a step to um, really um, help accelerate um, our efforts in the community um, globally around data citations. And so First and foremost, I think to start, I would like to talk a bit about um, our collective action and, and what we're doing around data citation globally. Um, when we talk about data citation practices, this is culture change across the community. Um, we are looking at making sure that research data, um, and not only research data, data site obviously focuses across the entirety of the research lifecycle, but there is obviously a big focus at the moment in ensuring that research data is surfaced as part of the scholarly record, but also that it is recognized um, in research assessment workflows as an example. And so if we look at this culture change and making, um, bringing this to a normative process, it's really important that we understand that there needs to be tangible incentives for researchers through policy and funder collaboration. And so if we look at the top, we have seen a lot of policy change and movements across the globe in requiring data citation or, or, or um, uh, uh, linking of your data to a scholarly um, research art article. But it's really important that we move to make sure that this is incentivized and that it's rewarding. If I ask a researcher at the moment, is there real tangible incentive for you to cite your data? And generally the answer that we will get is no. Um, it may be required and then we get to the point where the requirement or the policy, there's really no teeth in that, in that there's no incentive. And so it's important that we um, take that effort as a community. And this is part of our um, effort within the data citation corpus. It's not just about the technology, but also the social construct and how we work as a community to build this into recognition, funding opportunities, publication requirements, et cetera. But then at the bottom, we also have infrastructure and it's really important that one, we make it possible. And so we've made a lot of progress over the last uh, 10 or so years in making sure that uh, scholarly communication infrastructure is planned and connected together to track data citation. But we haven't quite got to a point where we've made this really easy for the community across stakeholders to 
uh, use this information. And so it's really important that we are focusing on making it easy that we can then start normalizing data citation and metadata reuse um, as a standard scholarly practice. And if we get these two working um, in parallel or, or from both ends, we then as a community look to make it normative and this becomes normative process or, or practice within the community. And so that's what we're trying to do here. A bit about data sites and, and make data counts. Uh, you'll notice on the slides that there's the make data count logo. And so I wanted to just contextualize data site is a global community. Uh, mm -hmm. We are a nonprofit membership organization with 2,800 repositories around the world across over 50 countries. But as part of our efforts as a community, we have a strategic effort uh, in leading the Make Data Count initiative. The Make Data Count initiative has been running for about 10 odd years and Data Sites has um, hosted the resulting services, infrastructure services that have come out of Make Data Count um, initiative over the years. And going forwards, we're taking a more proactive role in leading this effort. In particular, we have just um, appointed a director of the Make Data Count Initiative. Many of you may know Aracha Puble from uh, ASAP Bio, who will be joining the team and leading the Make Data Count Initiative. So everything we're doing around the Global Data Citation Corpus falls under the umbrella of Make Data Count. Make Data Count is there to develop open research data assessment metrics. Um, today, we're focusing more on data citation, but there's also a component of data usage, so views and downloads of data and how we track that across the community and make that openly available for reuse, which is also something that we do within the Make Data Count initiative. While we exist, it's, you know, as a community, and I think this I've touched on, so I'll, I'll skip through this fairly quickly. But it's really that we can advance knowledge, that researchers can build on the research of others, and that we're surfacing the entirety of the research lifecycle, um, specifically data in this context for reuse. Um, the collective effort around Make Data Count is really to support and inspire stakeholders across the scholarly communications um, community to make assessment of research data a priority in policy and practice. And one thing that I'll mention here is that it takes our collective uh, effort together at the same time. And so what we have seen over the years is often stakeholders wait for movement of other stakeholders. And so we may look at an example where publishers may wait, be saying, well, we'll, we'll move forwards and, and make this more of a priority when funders do. Um, we recognize it's important, but we want, you know, funders to build it into their workflow. But on the other side, we have funders saying, well, we need to wait until the publishers move forwards. And so we uh, end up in the situation where everyone's kind of looking at each other. And I think we at this really exciting point where um, with this, this strategic initiative around the data citation corpus um, and make data count where we are, are at this point is that we are seeing broad scale change across stakeholders in the community. And so that's really, really exciting. Um, we want to make sure that we build open infrastructure, we advocate uh, through a collaborative network uh, as a community, and we then can contextualize evidence-based bibliometric studies in understanding the way forwards. We want to avoid things like the data citation impact factor per se. And so we really want to make sure we do this in a responsible, collaborative way. But in order to get there, we need to make sure that we have a critical mass of metadata around data citation to move forwards. This much we know is true. Um, and so we have a responsibility as a community to make data count. Um, open data metrics are really powerful measures to incentivize the sharing of data that advances science for public good. We know that um, having an open corpus of views and downloads and citation counts is essential to move those efforts forwards. Um, we know that a comprehensive responsible credit system must include open data metrics. We know that we need to normalize data usage and data citation counts, um, and we need to do that 
um, in order to uh, take this first step. Um, we know that meaningful data metrics need to be based on evidence and open community standards, and we want to avoid incomplete bias metrics. And there's a lot of intricacies in, in the work that we're doing that we want to figure out with the community, but we can't do that until we move forwards. And so this is why um, the, a, a true understanding of the investment and reach and impact um, of research data is only possible with an open, transparent, um, and responsible data metrics. It's a journey. So this is something to note is that we are not at a point where we have all the answers and we have worked out everything. Um, and so many times when we talk about this, we as a community will jump to, well, how do we address this use case? So how do we address this? And so it's important that we recognize that we need to move forwards and we can't have everything solved initially. And so we are at a point where we are adopting best practices. We're starting to surface and accelerate the availability of data citation metadata. Um, and I'll get into some of the specifics about this in a moment. And then we can move into a point where we can contextualize these best practices, use these data metrics to enable evaluation, and then really incentivize the researchers to share data uh, in their uh, research workflows. Community support is key. And so what we've done under Make Data Count is worked with various uh, stakeholders over the years and um, many more stakeholders have been talking to us recently over the last year. And you'll see a couple more statements coming out and, and endorsements, but also an opportunity for the broader community at large to really um, get behind this initiative um, together um, for good. Why aren't we there yet? And this is something that uh, many people say, well, we've been talking about this for a long time. Are, are we, are we going to ever get there? And so one thing is that we're not waiting until it's perfect. We need to move forwards. Um, we um, want to make sure that we are doing this in a very open, transparent way. But we, we want to accelerate and, and make sure that data citation information, wherever it is, is available uh, to the community. We have seen inconsistent approaches. And so uh, many different silos um, built up and different um, corpuses of data citations. And so that was one of the drivers is that many stakeholders were coming to us and saying, well, we have all of these data citations available. What do we do with these? How do we consolidate these and put these in an open corpus that is uh, beneficial to the community? And then linked to this is that we often see, oh, well, there's not enough data citations. Sometimes because of these inconsistent approach or silos that exist is that it's not the entirety and we don't have a critical mass to actually uh, move forward. Uh, perfect is the enemy of good. So basics are ready. Um, let's start now. And so that's where we are at the moment. We will work through complexities and evolve with the community um, as, as we go forward. And we need broad scale adoption um, to get to data metrics where we can actually um, uh, incorporate this into research assessment workflows. Specifically, a bit about data citation. So um, we have a joint declaration around data citation um, and a well-established approach to data citation, making sure that data is utilized in the article and citation list. We've also been working with folks like STM in uh, putting together a statement, and you'll see that come out fairly soon around best practices um, and, and really a call to action for, for the publishing community. Um, but not only just publishers, also alongside that to talk about um, other stakeholders involved in the process, so researchers, funders, research institutions, etc. cetera. Um, we have a, a dedicated campaign for publishers and data repositories to really implement established best practices. Um, these are key stakeholders in the process. And then finally, um, the big effort that we're talking about today is the data citation corpus. Um, in building a corpus of these data citations using various 
text mining and machine learning techniques across the community in order to jumpstart this bibliometric work that is needed to, to move towards meaningful uh, metrics. Our focus is threefold for the data citation corpus. The first is that um, the challenge with data citation is not the process itself. So we, we know that if a researcher um, records a data citation and the publisher um, includes that in the reference list and the metadata that goes to Crossref, that this is exposed and we can track this. Um, but the challenge is that often this necessary metadata for reuse is not available in an open corpus and often doesn't flow through um, the different workflows. If I look at what we have at data sites at the moment, 99% of the data citations that we have are reported by the repositories saying this data set is cited by. And so this is curated metadata coming out of libraries and um, dedicated teams that are curating this but um, very little is flowing through the publication workflow. And so we are taking an effort to try and accelerate that through using various techniques to go and mine and look through um, the different corpuses of um, articles to pull out these citations. And so um, looking to jumpstart and accelerate that, but also calling out that um, publishers um, including citation metadata with their DOIs that Crossref will be exposed in the data citation corpus. Um, we also making sure that this is not manual, that we wanna make sure that it's simple to use. And so um, building on technologies that exist nowadays um, and applying these to find these data citations that are not in the metadata and bringing these into a central store um, is important. And then also while DOIs are great for the PID ecosystem for data citations, and obviously at data site, we have a big focus around DOIs in creation of a system identifier metadata, but also recognizing, and this is something that has been true for a long time at data site is we include multiple different identifiers in our schema, but also making sure that we uh, really uh, surface accession numbers as, as one key identifier and looking at others down, down the line, but making sure that these are also part of the data citation corpus, that it is not just exclusively around DOIs. Fundamentally, this corpus is going to address the major issue that known data citations exist in these various third party systems, but they're not compiled into a comprehensive publicly accessible corpus that the community can reuse. The corpus will be built um, in line with the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And that's really important that we have very clear guidelines around making the data openly accessible, but not just openly accessible, easy to access is really important. It takes a village. And so we've been doing a lot of work and uh, coordination across key partners in the community that have um, been focusing on um, open research data metrics, as well as um, various um, bibliometrics groups and working together. Um, this isn't an, a, um, a, I guess, invite only, you know, group. This is um, the initial group that we have been talking to fairly, fairly extensively. But over the last couple of months, we've also been um, talking to more and more stakeholders across the community and bringing everyone together, which is really good. Uh, some of the initial community input and the user stories that we gathered around the data situation corpus was that um, various users want to get a better understanding of their usage and impact of research data. Uh, they want to improve discipline specific search engines and show the research productivity of institutions. They want to see the reach of their work and impact. Um, they want to make sure that they understand how their research data is being used. Um, they want to make sure that they meet the expectations in regard to evaluation of open science and reproducible research. So bringing rigor and, and reproducibility is a key piece there. Um, and then ensuring accurate evaluation and appropriate credit for contributions across stakeholders um, and across borders and disciplines. The stakeholder groups involved in this corpus specifically um, are defined in, in a couple of categories. So uh, sources. So these are data sources that either donate or provide data under CC0 license. 
Um, these are classified in two categories, third party sources. So these are sources that aggregate or discover citations through various techniques, such as full text mining, machine learning, curation. Um, and then the other is data sources. So these are sources that collect citations as part of their deposit workflow. So such as data site Crossref, Envoy EBI. Um, this is where persistent identifiers and metadata are registered. Um, and this is um, the source, uh, the, the, that category of source. Data site acts as a custodian um, of the corpus. And so we manage the technical data store and we will be making the corpus openly available, as I mentioned, under the principles, uh, the POSI principles, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And then we have the community stakeholders, the users that benefit from the corpus to um, provide meaningful data citation um, metadata in, in their workflows. And so you'll see examples of even ourselves at data site in data site commons, but you know, Crossref, Koki dashboards, Welcome Trust looking to build this into their research assessment workflows, just as a couple of examples. We'll populate this corpus. So we have multiple sources that um, I mentioned across those two categories. And so um, building out the sources initially, I'll talk in a moment about the seed file and where we are in building the prototype, um, but uh, bringing these all together in the data citation corpus. And I'll also mention in a moment a bit about multiple sources, uh, creating trust and, and um, uh, 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 I guess, uh, confidence in, in the data citation. Important to note here that any repositories or publishers that submit data citations in their metadata to the persistent identifier authority will be included in the data citation corpus. And so whilst we have third party groups or sources that are able to uh, excavate and find additional citations, it's really important to note that any, any metadata that is submitted by repositories or publishers will be in the corpus and will track the provenance of these sources uh, and citation data. Building trust, so multiple assertions or claims around a citation is really important. And so sources citing the same citation can indicate that the information is widely accepted. Um, repetition of the same citation can increase confidence. In the same way, ORCID records have multiple sources. And so I've used an example here. You can see that this specific record in my ORCID record or this item in my ORCID record has three sources. So this one was an auto update from data site, but it could be that, okay, we have it from data site, Matt's reported it himself, and the publisher reported it as an example. Um, in this case, publisher doesn't apply because this is a record in Zenodo. Um, and the same applies for the uh, data citation corpus is that if we have an instance where, say, the CZI science machine learning algorithm has picked up a um, data citation and the repository has declared that same citation and the publisher has declared that same citation, we will have provenance that three sources have said that the citation exists and this builds trust in that assertion, if that makes sense. And so very similar to the way that ORCID has multiple uh, sources of the same um, assertion or claim around linking two entities together, we do the same in the data citation corpus. So a bit of an overview of the pipeline. This is what we're looking at doing um, within the um, uh, prototype. We are currently underway in building out the prototype. Uh, this will be completed by the end of May 2023. So within the next month, we will have the prototype set up. And that includes um, a seed file from uh, Crossref Data Site Envoy EBI and the Chan Zuckerberg Science Team. We also are looking to include um, some data citations from the open air um, graph as well through their Skrullix endpoint. And there's a few other sources that will be shortly introduced afterwards where we've been talking to um, that, that have uh, really valuable good citation metadata. Um, this is brought together in a data store. There will be a very basic uh, user interface on top of the prototype, which includes six visualizations across some of the initial use cases that we gathered. Uh, initially in the prototype, there won't be an API openly available simply because it is a prototype and we want to do a bit more work in scaling up and supporting that service. And so 
Um, I'll talk about technical milestones in a moment, but there will be an open CC0 data file that can be reused by the community that comes out of the seed file and initial data citation corpus. And then just to note that we continue to expand sources and users of the corpus as we progress with our efforts. This is a really exciting example. It was a random example that I pulled out. The CCI science uh, team has developed a machine learning algorithm that um, works through their corpus and was able to identify that this data set was cited. It was also included in the references of the paper, but we didn't have this in either the uh, data site DOI or the Crossref DOI. So both the article and data set DO, uh, DOIs did not have a record of the citation. And so using these algorithms and um, powerful techniques, we're able to surface these and recognize, oh wait, there is a citation that exists here. Uh, the technical phases that we're working through, it's um, important to us to work through an iterative release cycle. And so whilst you see key milestones here where phases are concluding, it doesn't mean that um, the key milestones within each of these phases will only be available at the end of each phase, but rather working through iterative releases and making sure that we continue to improve and learn from the community um, in addressing the downstream use cases. We are in phase one, which will conclude at the end of May. And as I mentioned, we will have the seed file data, the data dump and a basic user interface we we'll also have an open source machine learning algorithm that the community can use to detect data citations across a corpus of data. Um, we then move into building out uh, MVP, which will be scaling additional sources, building out the API for use, working with initial demonstrators and provide it more of an enhanced UI. And then finally, moving into a more scalable TRL eight or nine, um, stable um, corpus where um, we'll have more extensive coverage and improved API with you know very specific functionality such as segmenting the data some of that will be available initially um, but getting a bit more um, into some of those refined use cases um, in, in phase three and further demonstrators across the community Matt, and Matt, then just sorry, Matt, sorry, Jinjo, just, just yeah. keeping an eye on the time. We've got sort of two or three minutes left of your half hour. So uh, just I just thought I'd let you know if you want any questions. Yeah, I think this is my second last one. So yeah, um, Tip, I, I knew, I I knew that would be the case. Sorry, I'll let you carry on. No problem, no problem. Um, and finally, just talking, showing, you know, some power of leveraging the corpus. This is some work that we're doing at Datasite Commons. You can see, okay, Tetero Society, this is a research facility that has um various citations views and downloads coming through and different ways to link all the different outputs together track contributions and link this all together this is an example obviously the idea is that anyone can build and reuse open source um, code but also um, build this into uh, their workflows um, and things that they're doing in the community so that's something that we're working on and so during the conversation we strung it together um, thank you very much for your time and happy for I think we've got two minutes for questions. Otherwise, in the chat, I can also respond to a few questions um, as we go. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Matt. That's a fascinating presentation. Um, if, if anyone does have a, a quick question for a minute that Matt can answer in a minute or two before we move to uh, Annalisa's uh, talk, feel free to, to put that in the chat. Okay, well, maybe we'll, can we, you can, as you think of those, put them in the chat, and I'm sure Matt will be keeping an eye on uh, on that. Um, but maybe at this stage, we'll just go straight to uh, Annalisa. Um, so Annalisa's um, presenting on increased reliability of science with open, dynamic, and live methods in scholarly communication. Um, so she joined the JRC of the European Commission uh, in Italy in September 2022 as project officer working on alternatives to animal testing in biomedical research. And prior to this, she spent 13 years in the UK, gaining a PhD uh, in cardiovascular science and working as a lab researcher in, in several fields of, of biomedicine. 
Uh, in her last academic job as research fellow, uh, she focused on finding a vaccine against transmissible cancers affecting Tasmanian devils. Um, and two of her biggest accomplishments were managing to feed uh, a Tasmanian devil without getting her hand chewed off uh, and tummy stroking a very tall kangaroo. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that that comes up in this presentation, but I, I fear not. Um, uh, her other accomplishments can be found in LinkedIn and, and Google Scholar. Um, but without uh, more ado, I'll pass over to you, Annalisa. Uh, thanks very much, Simon. Um, so do I need to share my screen or you have the presentation? Can you, you should hear be me? Able to, yeah. You should be able to share your screen, okay. I think. Yes. Let, let me know if not. Okay, great. Um, Okay, just a second, because it's not my own computer, so... <laughs> uh, slide shows. Mm. Play from start. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Perfect. So, um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, as Simon said, my name is Annalisa and I work for the European Commission Joint Research Centre in the Systems Toxicology Unit. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, originally it was Sofia Battista Leite that had to make this presentation. I just want to get to give her the credit because she's uh, the person who started actually the initiative that I'm going to talk about. And the main, she was the main point of reference until recently when she left this unit and went to work somewhere else. So um, I will be talking about uh, this project that we called PROMAP. Uh, is an acronym for promoting reusable and open method and protocols. And just, uh, I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. So we are talking about life sciences here. So methods and protocol used in this particular domain, even though I think it will, uh, you know, a lot of the concept that I will be talking about would apply to other field of research as well. So just a brief introduction of uh, the place where I am from, I work, uh, because maybe nobody, uh, not everybody knows. So the Joint Research Centre is the research organisation of the Euro European Commission, and we support policy, uh, essential. We'll inform policy, and also we support the implementation of policy through uh, scientific research. There are um, the headquarters in Brussels, of course, but there are uh, other five centers across Europe the European countries. And I, we are based. I am based in Ispra in northern Italy. In particular, uh, the JRC in Ispra is home to the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, and our unit is part of this uh, uh, center. And what we focus on is mainly uh, non-animal methods in the life sciences, both in the regulatory side that in, uh, and then in the research side of life sciences. And we research this method, validate them, try to disseam disseminate and promote this method as well to at the end, increased trust in uh, method not based on animals, and so increase the uptake of this method in the life sciences. So, um, as you probably are aware, uh, or maybe not, method are the main sources of method are actually found in scientific publication, but you might be. Uh, uh, used to this feeling that methods are frequently lost in these publications because uh, you might have experienced what I'm showing here on the right side of the slide where you are trying to find to understand how the researcher did something, right? How they produce their data, but often you get through this endless chain of citation. So they will cite a paper, you go and look for that paper, you find an another citation, you go for to look for that citation, and at the end, you don't probably do, you don't even get a description, uh, a description of the method what you you were looking for at the beginning. So of course, this is very frustrating, but it's not 
personally just frustrating is also uh, not something very scientific, right? So uh, we think it's important to include proper method reporting in research communication to increase uh, tran uh, transparency, to increase, uh, uh, sorry, I did something that I shouldn't have done, okay. To increase transferability of science, to increase reproducibility of science, which of course uh, is one of the core value of, of the scientific method, and to increase translation of bench science to actually, you know, impact the life of citizen. So it's a matter really of increasing trust in advanced science by reporting properly what method were used to, uh, to obtain the results that we are presenting. And uh, so we decided, uh, years ago, we decided to have a look at the method and protocol in as reported in scientific publications which is a way or also with working with the community of researcher researchers publishing this method and with publishers as well and what we found first was that the majority of publication don't value actually the method section enough often is very short often as i saw uh, uh, showed you earlier uh, there are endless citations uh, ending in nothing, really. And this was something also that um, other people working with us told us because we have published uh, seven reviews of method not based on animal used in uh, seven disease area of research. And the people doing this review told us that it was very difficult most of the time uh, in finding actually uh, the method associated with publication and understanding if they were using animals or not in particular, because of course we are interested in this, but in general the method were lost in this publication. And uh, um, this is an example of what the consequences of this, because uh, you have this reproducibility project uh, this is a snapshot of their website, and this is a group of scientists with, who try to reproduce um, 50 high impact cancer papers, but, and so they, in their website, there is some statistics of what they found when they were looking to do this. And astonishingly, they found that 0% of the protocols, so the methods used in this publication was completely described. So no complete description. And this, of course, uh, ended up in, uh, in failure for them because uh, of the 50, papers that were they were trying to replicate they managed to do so only for 18 of them and and they claim that uh, the vague experimental protocols was one of the barrier to uh, replication so there has been a lot of in the last uh, few years there has there is, there, has, there has been a lot of attention on data and making the data as fair as possible, fair as an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. But there has been a lot uh, less attention on the method, which at the end is what produced the data and what underpins the data. So, and as a publication from the European Commission points out, it, Open us and, and open data don't guarantee reproducibility of science. And we think that instead, if we had open method, right, and details method, we could actually guarantee uh, reproducibility of science. The second thing that we found from this initial review of the um, of the of the scientific publication and their method was that actually the positive side is that a part of the community is aware of this problem and uh, there are some initiatives that are trying to tackle this issue. 
For example, one of them dating back to 12, 2012 was this workshop organized by the National Institute of Neurological Disorder and Stroke in the US. Uh, they were trying to understand how to improve the uh, translation from clinical research, preclinical research to clinical research. So in a way from bench research to research that then brings uh, actual cures for people and uh, um, they ended up with this paper, which is a call for actually more transparent reporting of method used uh, for uh, uh, optimizing the translatability of research. Another example is uh, uh, this website is called Protocols.io. And so here, this picture, I'm showing this picture to make a point, of course, and this picture was provided by Emma Ganley and from Protocols IO. In their website, they describe themselves as a secure platform for developing and sharing reproducible method. And the point I want to make here is that, so these cookies were made by tweaking a little bit the same recipes. And so while this might be very interesting and fun and in the kitchen, so you might obtain actually better cookies by tweaking the recipe, we shouldn't apply the same principle to scientific research just because just because we don't have detailed methods. So we can't think of, you know, trying to reproduce uh, uh, research uh, by, you know, guessing the, the method using that research. We need to know how the research was done uh, to reproduce it. So another example of this effort of improving method reporting is the existence of the STAR protocols uh, journal, which takes into consideration bo both the author perspective and the user perspective. And from a, from a author's point of view, the benefits are many, among which you know, the, pro uh, the authors can increase the reach and the use of their research can have another publication in an indexed and peer-reviewed journals. And this is, of course, a very big incentive for researchers and can improve the lab record keeping uh, to preserve their institutional knowledge. And of course, they can contribute to open science and help encourage reproducibility of science. So for us is import so what we would like to do is to increase the importance in scientific publications of method and protocols. So we decided to have a workshop last year with key representatives of the scientific publications wards and this is the list of uh, the people present at that workshop is both a researcher and a representative of research institutions, but also we had quite a few uh, people from the publishing world uh, to, you know, from to take their view on board. So what, uh, what did we, call, what did we get out from this workshop? First of all, um, so we think uh, what we came, uh, one of the conclusion that came out from this workshop was that uh, uh, we should, in the pub in scientific publication, the material methods sections uh, should be linked with a more in detail description of the method and protocol used, and that the methods and protocol should be ideally detailed, clear, complete, transferable, reusable, dynamic, transparent, reliable, reproducible, and open. So this might, seems like, might seem like a lot of uh, attributes, right? But uh, I think that once uh, you start by tackling a tackling few of them, uh, you know, the rest come actually more organically, and these we think are the attributes for for methods uh, to have methods which are really scientific and then can progress science. So we, from this uh, uh, workshop, there was a working group then that continued to work on uh, 
um, on coming up with recommendations for key groups, right? And these key groups are researcher, uh, research institution, publishers, and editors, and founder. And uh, the aim of these recommendations, which are just recommendations, are the, as the name says, it's that uh, to increase awareness of the problem, first of all, to achieve, to try to come up with uh, a way to achieve good method and protocol reporting, to develop better means to share and publish protocol, and also to increase funding and investment in the education of the next generation of scientists uh, on good reporting. So I'll go through um, a bit about uh, through the recommendation for the different groups, maybe highlighting the what we think are maybe the, probably the most important. So for researcher, first of all, there should be a responsible uh, shortcut citation. So avoiding what I showed at the beginning, the endless uh, citation chain uh, leading nowhere. So there should be a a support for a for a change in culture, of course. So a change in culture means, you know, a culture who values method uh, rather that, you know, uh, doesn't value method and details method reporting. So scientists should use always protocols when they're doing uh, the research. Uh, they should follow guidelines. They should be detailed in the way they, you know, uh, uh, write down their protocol and method. They should link, uh, they should be able to link uh, their method to dynamic protocols, so uh, protocols that can change in case is needed. Um, they could uh, uh, link specific results to specific methods, so to uh, you know increase the importance of this and advocate and offer training on uh, good method reporting. For research institution, again here there is a need of uh, change in culture really, which uh, brings bringing the good method reporting at the forefront. Uh, they should require offer training to uh, the researcher, the students, reward the efforts of uh, researcher uh, by giving prizes or awards and also make a good method reporting a requirement for PhD thesis. From publishing and editors, and this was the, the group which was most active actually in, um, in this project. They should again, uh, as the researcher, uh, have a responsible shortcut citations policy. Uh, they should ensure that researcher have an adequate space is where to put to describe their method because often at the moment the space is very limited. They should put the method session in front of paywall. Uh, again, link trying to encourage the linking of specific method to specific results, allow corrections, and of course, update guides for authors and reviewers accordingly. So to keep, you know, authors and reviewer always up to date. For founders, uh, well, this is a very heterogeneous group of uh, actually people, uh, organization, because you have private funders, you have uh, public funders, um, and we think they should support uh, open protocols, uh, reward good practices, uh, uh, you know, making uh, specific and, um, you know, um, statements about this maybe in when they do a, um, a call for grants. Um, focus on early career researchers because of course the earlier you get good habit the easier it is and then uh, maybe use evaluation uh, indicators to track progress and make the proper adjustment. So this is our roadmap for uh, our this project uh, where we started with a workshop, then we carried on with uh, a group of 
uh, people interested in uh, making some uh, improvement, advancement. And at the moment, we are in this final stage in which we are preparing a publication with uh, uh, the recommendation, of course, more in detail, the recommendation compared to what I showed you. And uh, one of our partner was the Quest Center for Responsible Research. And uh, on the website, you can find, uh, you can track the progress of uh, the ProMap project um, and also the name, the names of the people involved, if you are interested in knowing that. So in conclusion, we think that uh, 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 the future of research communication should be, um, again, sorry, should, should increase transparency and details, in particular, of course, of method, should increase reproducibility of scientific research, should increase the trust in method and the data, because if you don't trust the method, we think you can't trust the data as well and in a, and at the end advanced science as a whole and it should it should do this by improving the reporting of protocol and method which means more detailed actually reporting so yeah so thank you for the opportunity and these are the people which were particularly involved in this project uh, and thanks of course to Sofia which led the project uh, up to a few months ago and yes if there is any questions I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much Annalise, uh, a really really interesting and important project I think. Um, there's been one comment, I don't see a question, I think more of a comment from Kate uh, in the chat about requiring good reporting of methods in theses and dissertations, um, which mentions the impact of the ARRIVE guidelines, mm -hmm. um, but she says only seen guideline compliance studies in terms of published articles, not grey literature like mm -hmm. dissertations, so yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, um, it's interesting that sh she mentions uh, arrives guideline because they are guidelines for reporting animal experiments. If I'm, if yeah. I'm not wrong, yes. So, um, and we saw, we saw these things that um, usually the reporting of animal experiments using animal is much is much better than the reporting of uh, method not using animal and this is because of a series of reason because they have to follow these certain guidelines which are not in place for non-animal methods and there is the ethical motivation of being full and transpa fully transparent of when you are using animals all things which are not really present for in what we call in vitro methods so, or in silico method, method not using animals. And yes, there is definitely a lack though for uh, uh, publications such as thesis and master PhD thesis of master thesis. So we would like actually to improve that as well. Are there any other um, questions for, for Annalisa? How soon are you expecting to publish that final document, Annalisa? Uh, so we we will have a, a final consultation. So, you know, catch up with uh, the interested party, I think in the next uh, three months. So I will guess uh, hopefully by, you know, the end of the summer. Forward to that. And Kate has just replied in the chat saying that you know, it's worrying because the papers she reads are actually saying that guideline compliance with animals has a has a fair way to go. Um, and in the mm -hmm. the in vitro in silico methods reporting is even worse. Oh yes, yes, it's uh, it's much worse. Yes. 
that's what we our the people that were working with us on those uh, seven reviews on non-animal method told us sometimes you couldn't even understand you know what they were using in terms of uh, non-animal methods unfortunately yes so there is a you know there is an obstacle the obstacles are even more tough for that sector of research Okay. Well, if there's no further questions, um, I will just quickly, um, uh, well, of course, thank Annalisa. Oh, and thank Matt. you. Thank you very much. Uh, really grateful for you um, to presenting. Um, and uh, yes, uh, we, you know, to, I'm sure on behalf of the uh, everyone, um, say a huge thank you. Um, I'll just quickly mention that the next um, Force 11 session starts in five minutes. So that's 11 a.m. Um, UTC. Uh, and that session is. Uh, about Force 11. Um, so it's just going to describe what Force 11 is, its history and activities, and most importantly, um, you can learn how to leverage Force 11 um, to activate the community to advance a new future for scholarly communication. So I've, I've put the Zoom link um, for that next session in the chat to save you going to um, shed. Um, but uh, yes, once again, on behalf of, uh, of, of Force 11, thank you to Annalisa uh, and Matt, and thank you all for attending.